So I'm just going to start by passing out some little toys for us all to play with. This is a pair of uh, necklace that I made out of a broken spoon. So yeah, you've got to think on your feet in these, uh, or with your hands. So if, yeah, if you could keep moving them back and forth, they will hopefully add to the discussion. I'm just going to set up my uh, stopwatch. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> as we move these around the room, I'd like to explain that my work is essentially grounded in post-humanism, in this <clears throat> kind of performivity of objects and the interplay between things and people, subjects and objects. Um, I don't have any slides prepared, by the way, because I wanted to focus on these. Um, <clears throat> I've already noticed, actually, as they're moving around, people are immediately kind of gesturally getting to know the textures and the materialities of these things. They're inviting intrigue, in a way. Uh, one little tip, actually, I love seeing if I can get serious academics to do this, is to tap it on your head. <laughs> to get, <laughs> it helps you get an idea for the durability of different woods. Um, <laughs> You might also, uh, I became interested in woodwork originally when I was doing my BA in archaeology at Cardiff. Um, became fascinated slash obsessed with Viking shipbuilding techniques. Um, I then did my MA in Anthropology of Culture, Material and Design at UCL. I became interested in this, um, what Linda Herkham from Exeter University calls the missing majority, this uh, vast wealth of organic material that has not survived in the archaeological record. Um, arguably a slightly different case in Ireland because you've got a lot more and I love the National Museum of Ireland for that. Um, so yeah, I like to <clears throat> burn holes in all of my pieces because I think anthropologically in the past um, people would have been sat nearer to, next to or around the fires over which their meals were cooked so it's kind of playing on that sensorial experience of interacting with things. Um, when you first burn those holes it, it smells beautiful but then I treat them with a the linseed oil so they're food safe. Um, so it's actually kind of eradicated that smell, so maybe it's completely futile, I'm not sure. Um, I do not like to use, for my Facebook and Instagram accounts, so I don't like to use this kind of clean, white, neat design studio image that many people do. Um, I like to use organic like textures and layers of textures behind the pieces themselves. Um, most notably on cowhide. I, uh, I don't know how, but my brother's girlfriend has a cow skin from Argentina. That makes a really nice backdrop. I think it's a more accurate representation of the life worlds of the, the objects and the people and like I say I'm influenced by my studies of the past so I don't think it's a very accurate, you know, a realistic representation of how those things would have been used. I do use both ancient and modern technology. I use axes, adzes, knives, loads of different like, types of carving knife, uh, chisels and gouges, this kind of thing. But I don't shy away from power tools. The, um, the little chopping board that's around, that took a random orbital sounder to get the finish that I wanted. Um, including a little um, small handheld um, mechanised sounder called a Dremel. I'll come back to that in a minute. I like to play on these ideas of heritage and innovation. Um, tools that have a long history of use and tools that are you know, new to the market. I think you have to factor in both. Um, another little thing actually, talking about gestures, this heritage and innovation and gestures are going to come up frequently throughout this talk. Um, I was speaking to a, a, a fantastic woodworker called Mace Bryant based in Dorset and uh, we got talking about bowls and <clears throat> subsequently alienated everyone in a 50 metre radius of ourselves in a matter, <laughs> in a matter of seconds. His, his, uh, one thing I liked what he said is that with the bowls that you see around here and the, the spoons as well, um, it does imply this more nurturing gesture where you have to hold it closer to your mouth. Imagine um, how Chinese people and, and, and using chopsticks to not spill everything down yourself. You have to hold it closer to your body. This is kind of contrary to the kind of fine dining etiquette where there's a maintained distance between um, the consumer and the food stuff. So again, th this idea of gestures will come up frequently. Uh, just a little plug, I will be working with the British Museum um, from January on like a six to eight week project. Um, I've been charged with interpreting some, we're calling them Bronze Age woodworking tools because they're found in hordes with other Bronze Age woodworking tools, but we don't really genuinely know that yet. 
that's to come. Uh, they're kind of like small, chiselly gouge things that would have been hafted, I'm assuming, with a wooden handle. So watch this space, because hopefully something fun will come of that. I think we're going to make some replicas and go to town on some greenwood. Um, so essentially, I am just a, an anthropologist interested in material culture, with a background in material culture. And I think if we take the most basic dichotomy of material culture as, if you imagine a Venn diagram, you've got art here, artifact here, um, I'm interested in this overlap category of craft. It's got the, the functionality of, a, of an artifact, but it invites intrigue and has the beauty of an art piece. Hence, everyone is doing this kind of gestural behavior already. Um, I see you're enjoying that one there. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so art and artifact, and like I say, my speciality is craft. I identify myself as a craftsman, as a woodworker. So to kind of contextualize some of the things I'm gonna be talking about today, I'm going to draw, case, uh, draw attention to an, uh, an ethnographic case of my own um, when I was at the, uh, the Norwegian Folk Museum in Oslo. Oslo, and it's not every day when you're on holiday um, you chance upon someone who has the exact same hobby as you um, walking around a section of the museum called the Old Town. It's like an open air setup, like Beamish in County Durham or um, Paul Malwa just outside Cardiff. Um, I, was, I got sp speaking to a guy whose real name I will not use. Um, nor did I, did I include an image of him because the ethics of fieldwork suggest, well, dictate that if he wants to remain anonymous, he will. He didn't want anything that I said that he had said to affect his job at the museum itself. So I'm going to call him Anders from now on. Bumped into Anders carving a wooden spoon in silver birch, my favourite material personally. Um, he was also dressed up in period clothing from the 1770s with like those big long high white socks that go up to your knees and he was not allowed to use, he had to use technology only from that time period that he was meant to be representing. So no sandpaper basically. Um, it started to make me think about how heritage as a social phenomenon is not only perceived but also how it's performed and communicated and, and translated to an audience and whose idea of heritage. You know, it made me start questioning the power structures involved in heritage practices. Um, and the hegemonies, basically, and, and potentially to challenge those, um, which I'll see. So he did say, this guy Anders, Anders, did say that A, he felt quite silly in these clothes, he wouldn't be wearing them in any normal situation, and B, in his own work, he would be, um, he would be using sandpaper all of the time. So let's try and relate this now to the objects that you're interacting with, getting to know now. I mean, how would the Norwegian Folk Museum feel about my work? I mean. I do use a mechanised sander, it's called a Dremel 3000, I'll come back to that in one second, um, and I do not wear those silly clothes. I mean, this guy, let's consider the material context in which this guy is, is, is performing his skills. He's in this, this old town, so it's lots of barns from like the 1770s, beautiful barns from like the west and the north of Norway with like amazing wood carving on the outside. I won't go into a history of those barns just yet. Um, these are all kind of juxtaposed with Regency period buildings, less than 150 metres away is, I still can't figure out why it's there, an American style 1950s petrol station. Maybe it's adhering to Norway's oil wealth, I'm not really sure why, but this little microcosm that they've thrown together, I see anthropologically as purely innovative. That landscape has never actually existed. Those buildings represent vastly different time periods from huge regions as well. And then there they are, kind of lumped together in, in an entirely new set up an entirely new built environment. So in heritage practice, they've actually been purely innovative. You know, they've created a, a new environment for people to be immersed in, to experience and to, to interpret for themselves. It's, it's, I think it's an interesting point because heritage as social phenomenon, uh, phenomena, heritage and innovation would pull in opposite directions. But in this case, they emerge as different sides of the same coin. Um, and the more you break it down, the more complex it becomes. So let's relate that now to these. How would they feel about some of the pieces that I've made? I mean, my technology <coughs> is essentially Scandinavian. Most of my axes and adzes and, and knives are from Sweden. Um, my techniques also indirectly, I guess, are Scandinavian because the guy who taught me was taught by the Sami people in, uh, in Lapland. Um, I deviated early from that, I have to admit. I, I kind of put, put, put my own style on it. But yeah, so there, there is a cultural link in practice between these two contexts, but um, <clears throat> I think obviously they would probably completely disagree because it does not, they, they disagree with representing my work in their, in their forum because 
it's not in keeping with their idea of heritage. Um, which I think brings me to my next point quite conveniently because this piece I was talking about earlier on, the Dremel 3000, it's a, it's a mechanised hand sander using little sanding drums, you hold it like that, it spins around really quickly, it is loud and obnoxious but it does get the job done and when I'm working on commissions for trendy restaurants in East London I do need to churn out the numbers. Um, I can tell you that from a craft and DIY perspective, th these things are heritage pieces. They were first produced about 20 odd years ago. Um, they're no longer produced. There is a new model called the 4000. You can still get your hand on the 3000. Um, but they are spoken about very nostalgically and romantically by craft practitioners and DIY experts because when they first came onto the scene they did change everything. And um, <clears throat> their kind of more limited circulation now has achieved that, has afforded them, even in the space of 10, 15 years, a heritage status. So I think to throw a slightly curveball example, and some of you may, may disagree with me using this because it might seem unrelated, if you, if you think about the crafting of sound through the materiality of six nylon strings, <clears throat> Jimi Hendrix shredding away on an electric guitar with an electric pickup does not mean that. Spanish traditional flamenco has lost its cultural significance. They are obviously very different modes of making and represent very different contexts, but if you're interested in creativity, they are worth considering in correspondence with each other, correspondence in kind of an Engoldian sense. Um, so I'm going to slightly deviate from that now, talk more about art and archaeology and how I think they are related. <coughs> and um, we're going to stick with the Norwegian Folk Museum because I, I am an anthropologist and I do love a context in which to work. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the work of um, a photographer called Anders Beer Vilsa. He was obviously the inspiration for the, the spoon carver, Anders. He was a, a photographer um, active in the 18 and 1900s, um, very much bound up in the bourgeoisie in, in Oslo. <coughs> I think it was called Christiania at the time. Anyway, um, he was very much used to this world of English, French and Italian imports in and around the house, on the table, in the kitchen, out in the garden, this kind of thing. Um, very well connected man, photographed a lot of the Scandinavian royal families as well. And uh, the photos that I want to draw attention to specifically were those taken between 1890 and roughly 1908, 1910. This is the period when, Oz uh, when Norway is becoming independent from the Kingdom of Sweden. I think it was 1904 when they discovered the Osseberg ship. Anyway, so a new nation is emerging in need of much national rhetoric and national romanticism. He is conscious of the political change and how it will impact the people, his people, essentially the Norwegians themselves. <clears throat> so he takes it upon himself to travel west and north to the, to the fjordlands. And these photos between 1890 and 1908, 1910, he, he focused purely on people's ordinary lives, the, the functionality of what they were doing, and the, basically just re recording the materiality of their life worlds. He's got pictures of, like, uh, people collecting apples in orchards, he's got pictures of people tending livestock, like domestic chores. The two that I really like the most are women doing um, domestic chores in the kitchen. This is Norway at the turn of the century, you know, it's, it's very traditional. And also um, a shepherd with like uh, beautiful clothing on um, and next, like, next to the sheep and obviously the wool he is then wearing. It's quite an interesting setup. Um, here's a real knack for not only recording materiality but also then communicating it back. He indirectly fostered a tourist industry um, with w the wealthy, the bourgeoisie from Oslo travelling west to kind of discover discover their roots as it were um, and the roots of the nation that was emerging. He, um, the, one, the reason I love the kitchen is because I, I love kitchenware, that's what I make in my day to day business. Um, so that ability to not only record materiality but to to capture a sequence in culture. It's sequential because he is conscious of change. He is referring to not only what has been, and he is recording that, but it's also considering what may come around the corner as the change falls into place and Norway emerges, later to become a very wealthy nation, obviously. Um, it started to make me think, like, is this essentially not what archaeologists and anthropologists are obsessed with? This recording a snapshot or a moment in culture. If you imagine like the st stratigraphy in archaeological methodology, it's, the context is built up by ref with reference to what's happened before and what's happened, what's happening after. Um, it makes me think that, you know, there, there is much overlap between the art history essentially becomes archaeological theory in this context, I believe. We could take a few more examples from the art world. Um, Duchamp and his 
fountain, the, the urinal that you put in an art gallery context, or Andy Warhol and his soup cans, or Picasso and his mock African masks, all of this later in the uh, 20th century, no, yeah, no, 20th century. Um, these people are taking the ordinary objects of people's lives, the kitchenware, for example, the things that you'd find around the house, and escalating them. This is including Vulsa, by the way, escalating them into art pieces. Um, by presenting them in a new context, they imbue completely new social and economic value. Again, this is not this is essentially what archaeologists are doing, is it not? Working with found objects, found materialities, tweaking them, interpreting them, and then presenting them in a new light. Um, Vilsa taking the west of Norway and presenting it back to the to Oslo and the elite. You know, if we look at the cycles of exchange that this these conjure up as well. If you look at Georg Simmel's philosophy of money, where <clears throat> value is achieved by the maintained distance between the the beholder and the and the, the object or the, the 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 opposite of posthumanism you know is where we blur the distinctions between um subjects and objects this is this is kind of running counter to that so i think you know museums and and, and art galleries are operating in a largely similar modus operandi achieving very similar ends but maybe maybe there is that there is room for critique of that um, so I think just to end on on a personal note, my what I get from craft, my interpretation of craft, and what it can contribute to the table is that it, it frees up the flow of objects. Instead of taking an artifact and making it into art, but, you know, craft is just literally right down the middle. It, it it cuts through all of those. It does, I think, run counter to uh, some you know archaeological methodology where instead of working with found materials, anthropology and craft has actually encouraged me to actively create the material culture that I want to interpret. This is maybe the one fundamental difference between the two, but I think that therefore calls into attention the fact that there should be more dialogue between, between craftspeople and archaeologists. And uh, I'm, all, I'm here, guys, by the way. But anyway, that, that, that concludes everything I have to say, and uh, thank you for listening.